So tonight we're going to continue and finish off, hopefully finish off this subject on the Holy Spirit. It's all on YouTube, so you're allowed to go back and revisit it if you need to. Uh, if you've missed some, you can go back and look at what you've missed. And um, if you just need to listen to it again, you can listen to it again. It's great stuff. It's not because I'm preaching it. It's just great stuff. All right. Now, I was going to look in all the scriptures and do everything, but um, it could be difficult tonight to cover all of it with all those scriptures. You might have to look at some of it yourself. Okay. So, okay. Gifts of the Holy Spirit. The last gift in these groupings of giftings, that's the, the to-do gifts, the ability to do gifts. We were talking about how the, the gifts are separated into those three sections. And this is the very last, number nine. And the, obviously the scripture references 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, when it starts to list the gifts of the Spirit. And tonight we're looking at the working of miracles. Let me remind you that the gift of faith and the gift of miracles kind of co coexist. And I remember I said last time how um, even in, with the devil, uh, evil spirits congregate together in like, <laughs> and, they, and groupings. And, you know, well, they just copied Jesus because that's how Jesus operates with the Holy Spirit. And as often we receive groupings of these gifts and they work with each other together. A miracle happens when God supersedes the ordinary course of nature. That's what a miracle is. A miracle is when God supersedes the ordinary course of nature. The gift of the working of miracles comes when God endues us with the power by the Holy Spirit to do something completely beyond the range of human ability. It's pretty cool, isn't it? So we understand God's miracles, but we're talking about the gift of miracles, which is imparted into us to give us, us, say us, us. say me, me. <laughs> That's better. me, I, <laughs> the Holy Spirit puts into us the gift of miracles. An enduring of power by the Holy Spirit to do something completely beyond the range of human ability. Wow. I want some of that. <laughs> I want some of that. I don't want it to be a showman. I want it to reach a need. You know, that's the only reason I want to see the gifts of the Holy Spirit working. So we are empowered and released by God to effectively touch the world in which we live. And I can't think of anything better than people getting healed and set free and miracles taking place. I can't think of anything better than that. It's like, awesome. I can't believe it. I'm, and I, I can believe it. And I keep asking God, let's see it with my own eyes. Because I, you know, I've read the Bible enough times. And I've heard other countries where miracles take place. And I want to you know, see some. Even if I watch somebody else do it. Because you know, I don't mind. It's not about me. I want to see miracles. Okay. A miracle is, is usually an instantaneous occurrence as distance from a manifestation of healing, which may be gradual. So healing, can, you can pray for something to be healed, and there can be a process of healing, a time of healing. Some, but sometimes it's miraculous instant. Okay. All the gifts of the Spirit are miraculous. That's interesting, isn't it? Mm. So we're talking about the, um, the working of miracles, and we go, oh, wow, working of miracles. But every time we operate in any of the gifts, it's a miracle. So prophecy, speaking in tongues, is a miracle. You're actually flowing through the miraculous. So you might just think you're, preaching, you're speaking in tongues or prophesying, but you're actually also... Expressing the gift of miracles. I like that because it, it makes it, well, I can do some of that. <laughs> I can do some of that. Maybe I can do some more. But this working of miracles or the gift of miracles is, um, is a reference to power. Reference to the, to the power of God. 
instantly working in someone's life. The Bible is a book of miracles. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> See, if we need faith, we need to read our Bible. God is a God of miracles. Do we believe it? Yeah. Or a miracle stopped? Can we believe God's still a miracle working God? Can we? I do. I don't see them, but I believe it. See, I could say, oh, I haven't seen a miracle for 20 years. I don't think miracles happen anymore. Or, God, I want to see a miracle because you're the miracle working God. But, you know, sometimes some of our supernatural miracles are perhaps a little bit small and they fly under the radar of the, of the big ones, you know, but they're still miracles, yeah. still miracles. We've had miracles where, you know, we've, we've been unsure what to do in that situation and we've just had that instant, you know, boom, it's happened. That's a miracle, you know. Okay. Christianity is a faith founded, founded upon miracles. Look at the book of Acts if you need proof. The church was born out of miracles. Without the manifestation of miracles, Christianity is lacking in cred credibility. It's a sign of God. And people say, oh, I can't see God. They see someone get a miracle and they, they'll see God. <laughs> Miracles gives us an undeniable proof of the resurrection. If Jesus was uh, not alive, his name would have no power to heal the sick and work miracles. Peter convinced the unbelieving Jews of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and their need of repentance on the strength of the fact that Jesus' name still had, still had the power to heal the sick and work miracles. They saw the evidence in Acts, it gave boldness to the believers to preach. It made believers hungry to have more for, of God. So when they saw miracles, it made them, you know, many of the people followed Jesus just to see miracles. They weren't Christians. Hopefully a lot of them became Christians, but a lot of them just followed because, oh man, it was pretty exciting. There wasn't many people doing miracles at that time. Maybe some you know, charlatans and some tricksters and illusions. <laughs> but he was a man that was doing some pretty serious miracles. Everybody wanted to see what was going on. It convinced and convicted men of their sins. I'll give you a scripture on that one. It's Acts 5, chapter 5 and 28 and 33. It says, 5,000 were converted in one day through one miracle. Acts chapter 4 and verse 4. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 14. And through, through the miracles that took place, it spread the gospel. Before Jesus started to work miracles, and no one followed him anywhere. So before Jesus was popular, he wasn't doing the miracles. He often preached in a synagogue because Luke tells us that. But when he started to do miracles, his fame went out into every place of the country around about. You'll find that in, in Luke chapter 30, uh, Luke 4 and verses 33 to 35. And you know, and Jesus had a, a time to do miracles. Did you know that? It was, it was something planned by God. Because if you remember, the very first miracle was the turning of the water into wine at the wedding. And he actually said, it's not my time to do this miracle. It's not my time. Jesus had an understanding, an intimate understanding of when it was God's time to do something. And that's why Jesus, I mean, Jesus could have probably uh, done some miracles when he was 10 years old. Because he had, he was Jesus. He was God. <laughs> he had the miraculous power. I always laugh at. Um, I've seen this little cartoon, and Moses is sitting in the bathtub, and he's a baby, and he's parting the water with his bath. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. It makes me laugh because 
In all, all honesty, Jesus could have done miracles at any age because he had the power and he had the anointing and he had the authority to do miracles. He was the Messiah, the Saviour. But obviously there was a time place when it was the right place to do those miracles. And when he started to do the miracles, it says here, a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them, which were diseased. Everywhere the disciples preached, healed the sick, cast out demons and worked miracles, multitudes turned to Christ. That's why we need to see miracles today. So we can see people giving their lives to God. So people suddenly start to get a, a new awe of God. I mean, to me, it would be obvious, wouldn't it? To me, I, to me, if I saw somebody healed of a miracle, I'd be going, oh, wow, you know. But I do know some people's hearts are still hardened and they go, oh, no, that was a trick, you know. That was some, something weird going on there. It says here um, in Acts chapter 9, verse 42, that when Peter raised Dorcas from the dead, many people in Joppa believed. I imagine that would be quite amazing to see a, a dead person raised to life. In Acts chapter 14 and verses 8 to 18, there's a whole lot of stories and scriptures about the signs and the wonders that the... Um, that the disciples or the apostles were doing. Many people were being healed. The crippled man was walking and leaping. Many people brought the sick. It was even to the point where even the shadow of the disciples walking along, the shadow, would bring healing into people's lives. There was an incredible supernatural work of God taking place in the birth of the church by the power of the Holy Spirit pouring out those miracles upon people. And multitudes and multitudes of people uh, were being healed and set free and demons were cast out. The book of Acts closes with the miracles in full swing in Acts chapter 28 and verses 8 and 9. It says here, when people saw no, Publius, I don't know how to pronounce that. P-U-B-L-I-U-S. Should we call him Publius? Call him Pubby for short or something? <laughs> hey, Pub. If, if we were in Australia, we'd call him Pub because we shorten everything. Hey, Pub, how are you going? <laughs> when the people saw him healed, they believed that if God would heal one, then he was able and willing to heal everyone that needed and when people think and believe right about God, they get from him what he wants so much to give them. See, when you see God moving, it stirs up your faith. And everybody else, faith will start to rise because God wants to release healing into their lives as well. There's different kinds of miracles. There was miracles of deliverance. We see that often through the um, book of Acts, deliverance of evil spirits. Because you see that the power of miracles heralds the kingdom of God. It demonstrates the kingdom of God. And it comes to destroy the kingdom of the devil. There's something about miracles that it just separates. <laughs> it just comes in, that, you know, it's all over. There's just a miracle, and then God is, um, is acting and God's glorified. Those miracles of transportation. Remember Philip was talking to that bloke? The next minute he was boom, taken somewhere else. Beam me up, Scotty. Yes. Mm -hmm. I often think, God, I'd like to just be, uh, just do it every weekend, and I'll go to Russia every weekend. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> It'd be pretty good. There are many other instances and miracles are, are performed by God in the lives of the believers, sometimes even without the co cooperation of the believer. 
So some some miracles like the shadow was it just happened, you know. Paul was very significant in miracle working. Peter raised the dead. And Peter restored another person's name. Sounds like eucalyptus, but it's not. <laughs> Why do they have such strange names for us? <laughs> but you know, so we can we saw that the, the, the disciples of Jesus had a they had a real power thing happening. The gift of miracles was taking place. The practical operation of this gift, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, is to create confidence and authority. So, that miraculous anointing that comes on, it, it brings faith in people. It brings faith. As that anointing starts to flow, there is a lift of people's faith. And then, on the person operating that gift, there becomes a, a sense of authority, as they say in Jesus' name, you know, do this, do that, be this, be that. You know, there's, there's a, there's a, it's twofold. There's a sense of general faith in people growing. There's like a special atmosphere of faith that flows out when the gift of miracles works. It's like it just starts to flow out and flow out and flow out. It's like I can, I can imagine if you're in church, you know, and somebody's getting healed. As that person's being healed, does that... There's that flowing effect out into the congregation, just going right, right to the very back where all the sceptics hang out, you know. There's that flowing of faith going, and there's an increase in faith. And there comes upon the person operating that gift of miracles, that confidence and trust in God and, and, and authority, you know. Casting out demons was a miraculous work. You know, sometimes we, sometimes I think because of the, the understanding about the, the, the dominant realm in deliverance, we've, we've put it into an area where you can intellectually learn about it. You could sort of nearly go to college and do a, a degree in deliverance, you know, and you could be taught the formulas and the process and the way to, to go through a deliverance session and what you have to do. And how, but we mustn't never forget that the casting out of a demon is a miraculous thing. We don't do it. And it's a, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit operating through us and it's not what we've learned. Right. It's not what we've learned. We don't have to learn it. If you, you know, if, if someone needs deliverance... You can deliver them. Because by faith you can trust in God to give you the power to release that person. You have the authority in Jesus' name. And as you speak that out in faith, your faith, as you speak that out, then the miraculous can be released. And sometimes I think sometimes we we think we can intellectualize stuff into like studies and degrees in universities and but we've got to come back to this, even that. Needs a miracle. It needs a miracle. It needs a miraculous work of God taking place. A spoken word of faith and authority. Elijah said that the God who answered by fire should be Israel's law. And the fire that came down was an example of the working of miracles. You know, and I often talk about this this story. I say story, but you, you know what I mean. Not it's not a fable. It's not an urban legend. It's a true encounter. But I love this encounter of Elijah. I, I just love preaching about it because it's such, for me, it, it paints this incredible picture to me. You know, there's Elijah representing God. There's going to be, a, there's going to be a choice of whether the nation of Israel continues walking with God or turns to Baal. 
They were, they were at a crossroad in their history. It was a crucial moment. And there's Elijah up on the mountain by himself with a horde of these other idol worshippers. And I love his confidence and his authority that he had in him because there wasn't any doubt in his mind who Israel should serve. See, he had a confidence in God, that God was the God of Israel. That was He had a confidence in the covenant that God had made to Israel. That was his strength. He understood God, and he understood the ways of God, and he understood the covenant that God had made with Israel, so he could trust God that it was the right thing that Israel would be continuing to walk with God. Because if he was not, oh, well, not sure what, what way we should go here, he would have lost the battle. <laughs> but there was a, a confidence and an authority and a faith level in him that was miraculous. Miraculous. He took on a whole horde of these incredible evil people who went into this ritual, ritualistic frenzy when they were trying to get their God to send down the fire, I mean, it would have been scary. I don't know if you've... Well, I don't think you've ever encountered that. I've never encountered that. But um, in my briefest of smallest seconds of my life when I was in New Guinea, um, you know, I've seen some of those um, tribal men, you know, the, uh, the witch doctors, basically. And just looking at them makes you frightened. And they got these like temple houses that they, and all the masks and scary stuff. And you, well, it's scary just looking at a couple of those guys. And here's Elijah with, there's a horde of them. And they're all possessed. They're all full of satanic power. They're all cutting themselves and screaming and, you know, it's been awful. It wasn't a charismatic, you know, happy choir movement going on. It's been awful. I would have been scared to death. <laughs> Going, oh my goodness. One man taking on this lot. But he had his confidence in God. And we see this incredible miracle. An incredible miracle taking place. And I just have to love this guy. I love his audacity. Here he is faced with this incredible, dark, dynamic, fierce opposition. I mean... You know, we think sometimes, oh, the devil's trying to get me. You know, you know, we get all worried. Here he was in the middle of the battle. In the middle of the battle. And he goes to him and says, you know, cry out and maybe God to sleep. Most of us, when the devil comes to us or something satanic influence is happening, we get a little bit scared. And here he is taunting them. <laughs> Come on, shout loud and maybe he's on holidays. You know? And after he's finished taunting them and it's his turn to work a miracle, he says, come on, guys, pour water. Pour water over this offering. Pour water over this sacrifice. Let's soak it and soak it through. I mean, the task alone of just getting fire from heaven was incredible. But he made it even more crazy by pouring water and water and water. But when the miracle took place, that's what I love, the Bible even talks about how it, it just licked up the water. The flames just licked the water up like petrol. Amazing. It's a wonderful working of, it, of the gift of miracles, but that was even in the Old Testament. Which I'm always amazed, because you just sometimes, in my brain, I don't know if you're in your brain, but maybe I'm just more Pentecostal, but in my brain, you know... Um, the Holy Spirit started to work on the day of Pentecost. Because <laughs> that's when he came. Creation. That's when he came. It was that creation. You're right, you see. Yeah. You see, he was. Yeah. The Holy Spirit brooded over yeah. the Lamb, yeah. which was where the darkness, wasn't it? And he's always been brooding over the people of God. And they, and they experienced the Holy Spirit without the, the understanding of what we have today. There was a different, different outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, obviously. It's for individuals. 
it was a it was more for appointed people, not for general population. So prophets and priests and yeah, receive that kind of uh, power of the Holy Spirit. So the the gift of miracles. That's a short study, isn't it? Yeah, amazing. Okay. A miracle is when God supersedes the ordinary course of nature. Oh, I just like that. And then I like it when it says, and God endues us with the power of the Holy Spirit to do something completely beyond the range of our human ability. Now, I talked about stepping out before. Well, oh, sounds like a miracle is a pretty big step. <laughs> Beyond the range of human ability. See, God calls us not to just live a comfortable Christian life. God calls us to, to extend out further and do things that are beyond the normal, beyond the human possibility. Do you know you can do things that are humanly impossible? Yeah. I, I once knew that there was, a, there was a religious group, a bit strange, like a bit of a cult, but they believed that you could fly. <laughs> they believed they could fly. Yeah. And um, people were actually levitating off the ground. Levitating off the ground. But, you know, it was a cult. Mm. But, but the fact is, God has much for, more for us than we imagine, you know. Again, it's, it's not for us. And that's sometimes the downfall of of us or the church at times is we we learn all this stuff but we, we take it on board for ourselves. Sure, we there might be times in your life when you need a miracle. Well, there's probably many times, isn't there? Actually. God, I just gotta have some help here. I need a miracle. I need, you know. Sure there's that time in our lives. But it's not every day. The people around us need the miracles. People around us need healing, being set free. We need, we need just to keep surrendering our hearts to God and start saying, God, will you use me? It's, a, it's kind of a, like a big step, really, these gifts. I don't, I don't think they progress in, in greatness in, in the nine gifts. But when you, when you think of the first gift... Which was? Who knows what the very first gift was? Hmm? Um, tongues. Okay, cool. The very first gift is the gift of tongues. Now, when you think about it, in, in the scheme of all of what I've been talking about for so long, speaking in tongues is incredible, mind-blowing, supernatural, wonderful, fantastic, incredibly good. When you think about it, it's not so incredible, is it? Compared to raising the Compared dead. Compared to raising the dead and seeing miracles. <laughs> yep. It's like God wants to, to take us on a journey of increasing our faith. Increasing our faith. So that as we, we learn to trust God for his provision, uh, we can step out into more. And I guess that's why... I, I ask you to pray tonight. Because we've got to start stepping. We've, we've got to start, you know, feebly, scaringly taking a new step in, into, into the things that God wants for us. There's no good me uh, teaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit if in a year's time we're still exactly the same as what we were years before. You see, this, this truth is not for us, for our intellect. This truth is for our spirit so that we start to understand the possibilities that we have in God to live an incredible supernatural life. Who wants to live a supernatural life? Or do you just want washing up the dishes life? You know? I want the supernatural working all the time. I want to see the miracles of God. I want to see people's yeah, people's salvation is one of the biggest miracles we can see. I think we're all miracles. 
There are all miracles, and there's many more miracles to come for us to see, but we shouldn't settle for less. We should be ordinary, supernatural. It should be just part of our everyday life. Naturally supernatural. Naturally supernatural. Mm. It's an awareness, building an awareness. And, you know, I, I've spoken and spoken and spoken, and, and we've got to find an intimate relation with the Holy Spirit. We've got to learn how to cultivate that in our prayer life. Don't worry about if If you went and spent... All day praying to the Holy Spirit, God will not get jealous. Okay? Don't worry about trying to divide up, you know, I'll pray for Jesus 10 minutes and God 10 minutes and the Holy Spirit 10 minutes. I'll keep it all even, you know, so no one gets hurt feelings. Doesn't matter. But if we are to walk in this supernatural life, having the Holy Spirit who lives within us, oh, Holy Spirit lives within us. The same power that rose Christ from the dead lives in you, Kathy. Well, that should get us up in the morning, shouldn't it? Put a smile on our dial. Christ, through the Holy Spirit, lives in us. That power, dynamite power, dunamis power of the Holy Spirit lives in us. And why does it live in us? It lives in us so we can produce the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we can operate the gifts of the Holy Spirit, manifest the gifts of the, of the Holy Spirit so we can see people's lives being changed. Our lives and other people's lives. Our circumstances and other people's circumstances being changed. But we've got to have a close friendship, intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. You need to know His voice. It might not be a voice. It might be a gut feeling. It might be like having worms in your stomach, butterflies. It might be you know, shaky. It might be hairs rising. You know, it's not just voice. It, the Holy Spirit nudges us in so many different ways. But we have to wire into the Holy Spirit in the way that our personalities work with Him. Because God speaks to us, but we have to listen. And he doesn't shout at us. The Holy Spirit doesn't shout. He's, he's gentle. When he speaks, some of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit are pretty spectacular. But when he nudges us along, when he imparts into us a gift to be released, it, it's sensitive. That's why I encourage you, to, let's keep praying out loud in our church services. Come to church to pray a prayer of thanks or a prayer of encouragement or, you know, somebody might have been on your heart all week. Pray for that person. Let, let's be people that, that let's, let's practice. We're actually going to sit and understand, but what is it going to do? So we must start to put into practice some of these things. Activate it. Activate our faith. You know, start to believe God is going to give you a vision. Put somebody on your heart. Give you a prophetic word. Sometimes we, we, we try to work it all out. So, oh, okay, God, uh, this week I'll pray for a prophecy. So you pray all week for a prophecy. And you, you expect God to write the whole prophecy out so you understand it all and you practice it ten times and you know exactly what you're going to say and then you'll come to church and you'll prophesy and kind of well, everybody will go, wow, you know, it's wonderful. But it doesn't happen that way. Half the time you won't, need, won't even have a clue what you think you're going to say. God might put one word in your mind, one thought, one feeling, and as you get up and you start to speak it out, it flows out like, I, I mean, that's how I learned. God, one time, put one word. God. That's all I got. So I went, God, and the rest came out. But we've got to be comfortable with each other, feel safe, and we've got to grow our faith. See, God wants to use you. All of you. He, he chooses to use me, and I'm amazed. 
And if he can use me, he can use anyone. Anyone at all. I always laugh. I've said before in a Bible college in Ukraine, you know, God used a donkey. Remember when the donkey spoke to the prophet? If God can use a donkey, he can use me. He's used me. If he can use a donkey and he can use me, he can use you. Tommy? Yep. Do you agree, Kathy? Just not and say yes, Tom. <laughs> I know you agree. I know you agree. I don't want this to be a study in intellectual knowledge. Oh, yes, we've, we've learned the nine spiritual gifts. I can even say them, but not I want it to be life changing. I want you to fall in love with Jesus again. I want you to get into prayer and, and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you just start to cry. And you just break your heart because God's presence just comes down, touches our lives, and changes us. It's got to come here, it's got to come into our hearts, it's got to come into our spirits, it's got to be something we live. And we start turning into what the Holy Spirit wants. God wants to do so much. But people are walking around like this. You know, they don't want to hear. I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to be stretched. I don't want to take a wobbly faith step. I want to be comfortable and stay where I am. Well, that's why I don't have a big church, because I say, no, you're not going to stay where you are. You're going to grow, Kathy, Wendy, I'm going to pick on all of you, Susan, Paula, Paula, <laughs> Angel, and Carrie, and Tom. Amen. Amen. You know, here to have a good time. Here to have a blessed time. <laughs> blessed, not a comfortable time, but blessed. An extraordinary time when you're going to be busting to come to church to tell me of this miracle or this supernatural thing that happened or this prophecy or this word of knowledge or this gift of faith or that took place when you were in a shopping centre or down the street or to your neighbour and they're going to come in all giggly and <laughs> what to tell you. So we've got to believe it will happen and God wants to do it. And God, I want to tell you, God wants to use you. I always heard, and I, and I think it's true, that as individuals, there are some people that we can touch that others can't. That God wants to use us to touch them because no other person can touch that person like we can, you can. That God will arrange people to come in and out of your lives so you can have an influence upon them. And every time you have an encounter with someone that's a little bit out of your normal group of whatever, ask God, what are you doing? Where am I going with this? What shall I say? Is this an opportunity? Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. You don't know what this smallest word or sweet smile can do to somebody. God wants to use you. God wants to use you. The question is, are you willing? The willingness. Are you willing? Are you willing not to be scared of God? Listen, we, we can all be scared of God sometimes. Especially when you start to step out on these new stones that you haven't stepped out on. I mean, the old stones get quite, you know, comfortable. But the new stone, it's tricky. Haven't been there before. <laughs> God wants to use us all. Let's pray. Dear God, tonight as I just close this night, I want to thank you for your goodness and your mercy. I want to thank you for your saving grace in our lives. I want to thank you that you've chosen us to be your vessels. Vessels made out of clay but filled with God. Filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to thank you, God, that your desire is to use every one of us for your kingdom's purposes. Lord, I want to thank you that you have a generous, generous destiny over our lives. You have a purpose that you've already written out and you're already implementing the plan over our lives. And God, I ask tonight, Lord, help us to surrender our life to you. 
surrender our lives to you, God. To be able to say, God, whatever you want me to do, I will do. Wherever you want me to go, I will go. Whatever you want me to say, I will say. And that's not an easy thing to say. When you say, God, I'll do anything, and God says, try this, and you go, oh, I'm too scared. Not that. Not that. I used to say, God, don't send me to India. He sent me to Nepal. It was just as bad. God, we want to surrender our lives to you. We really do. We want to. And you know we struggle. And, well, we, if you ask us something too big, we're going to get worried and upset. But God, will you see our hearts tonight? God, we want to be available to your Holy Spirit to work his gifts for us. Holy Spirit, we say yes to you, Holy Spirit. Yes to you. Holy Spirit, come and work through us. Holy Spirit, we don't want to hurt you. We don't want to push you away. We don't want to neglect you. We want to have ears to hear what you're saying to us. We want to be people that will move under your unction and under your anointing to speak when you call us to speak and do when you call us to do. Help us, Holy Spirit, to, to know you even more. Help us in our Christian life to do the best that we can do for God. Help us to live our lives in such a way that we are showing people that we have a God and we are loved by God. And that we have the answer to this world that's lost and hurting. God, we give you our lives tonight. We want to take a new step of faith with you. We want to be stretched. Oh, we sort of want to be stretched. Help us, God. Help us with our courage or lack of. Help us to do your will, I pray. Help us to have surrendered hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name.